this film was produced to perpetuate the memory of Marie Rose Farron. We believe that she lived an unusual life of piety and that knowledge of her life would be a source of inspiration, comfort, and strength to those who love God during these days of worldwide impiety toward God. It is our hope that through this film, the kind of love which bound this child of God to her creator will become better known and imitated. She only lived to the age of 33 years. She spent most of these years confined to a bed of pain. Yet she has helped many souls to gain new insights into loving God and men. We are attracted to Marie Rose Ferrin's virtues and believe that these should become better known so that God can be better loved. We do not say that she was a saint. We leave such tremendous judgments to those who have been appointed to make them. All we know is that Marie Rose Ferrin loved God very much. And we want as many as possible to know about this and to imitate her in this so that the love of God and men might be a more impelling force in the world today. This is Precious Blood Cemetery in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and we are looking at the grave of Marie Rose Ferrin. An ordinary girl with an extraordinary life is the simplest way of beginning the life of Marie Rose Ferrin, the heroine of suffering and victim of love from Woonsocket, Rhode Island, whose life is one that has reached from one side of the earth to the other, touching the hearts of the rich and the poor alike and having a special way of reaching the simple ones as well as the hearts of hardened sinners. She suffered and prayed in place of friends and relatives and had a special love for priests whom she called Other Christs. Rose acquired this great love and faith from her parents, John Baptiste Ferron and Delima Mathieu. Their life was one of poverty, but very rich in love and faith. In those surroundings, the life of Rose Ferrin bloomed into one of the most beautiful roses in God's heavenly garden, whose petals are more and more falling to all parts of the earth, touching the hearts and souls of those who are stumbling in the dark. This rose was born on May 24, 1902, in saint germain de grantem in Quebec, Canada. She was named after the Blessed Mother Mary, the mystical rose, and to her family and friends, she was Little Rose. This photo was taken after the baptism of Little Rose. Mr. Ferrin's blacksmith shop is located on the left. Like the Christ she was to imitate, Rose was born in the rear shed in the surroundings of straw. The Ferrin family moved to Fall River, Massachusetts when Rose was three years old. She was always ready to sing and play, but just as ready to pray. She already had devotions to St. Anthony of Padua and to the cross. It was at this time that the child Jesus appeared to her. He was carrying a cross and looked at her with grief in his eyes. He spoke to her and she spoke to him. At the age of seven, she was already pleading in behalf of souls, and Jesus himself taught her the following prayer, which she said every day. O Lord Jesus, when I reflect upon the words which thou hast uttered, many are called, but few are chosen. I fear and tremble for those I love, and I beg thee to look upon them with mercy, and behold, with an infinite tenderness, thou dost place their salvation in my hands, for everything is assured to him who knows how to suffer with thee and for thee. My heart bleeds under the weight of affliction, but my will remains united to thine, and I cry out to thee, Lord, it is for them that I want to suffer. I wish to mingle my tears with thy precious blood for the salvation of all those I love. Thou wilt not turn a deaf ear to my sorrowful cry, and thou wilt save them. 
This is the church of St. Rock in Fall River, Massachusetts. The Ferrin family lived nearby. Rose's obedience and piety were evident when she was eight. A priest who was conducting a mission in Rose's parish was impressed by the manner in which she attentively listened to his sermon and by her practice of saying the rosary and making the way of the cross after Mass. She learned this from the example of her parents, for Mr. Farron attended Mass daily and never left the church without making the way of the cross. And Mrs. Farron, with all of her household tasks, always found time to sit with the children and read the lives of the saints to them. The rosary was her constant companion, and when her first child was born, she offered it in honor of the first mystery of the rosary and continued this practice until all the mysteries were thus honored. When the children were young, Mr. Ferrand liked to see them sing and dance to the music of his violin. One day, Mr. Ferrand was on the front porch with all of his children. A man who was passing by looked at them, then he took a second glance. Mr. Ferrand looked at the man and said, yes, they are all mine. When Rose was 10 years old, she made her first Holy Communion. And after that, her love for Jesus grew more and more. This family photo shows Rose in the center, dressed in white with the big ribbon in her hair. Rose was 16 when this photo was taken. Her teenage years were full of sorrows, disappointments, and sufferings. When she was 12 years old, she wanted to become a nun. Before she was old enough to enter a convent, she decided to work in order to help her poor parents. But Jesus had other plans for his little Rose. Rose worked for about a year caring for a lawyer's children. On one of her days off, she carried a hot dinner to her father at work. She missed the trolley and walked in the early spring slush. In the evening, she was ill and running a temperature. And the following morning, she was confined to her bed. When she recovered from this illness, her right hand and left foot seemed to be paralyzed, and later she had to use crutches in order to walk. At the beginning, the doctor said she had an acute case of rheumatism, but actually she came down with polio. Little Rose had a lovely voice, and she liked to sing in the church choir. When she was able to walk, her brothers sometimes carried her to the church so she could sing in the choir. The time of trials had arrived, and Jesus began to prepare his bride for her mission. The affliction of her leg, which grew worse as time passed, prevented her from taking part in normal activities. Because she could not understand the designs of her Jesus, Rose shed many tears during these times, yet she was never discouraged. Though she accepted the cross Jesus gave her, this did not lessen her pain and anguish. Her physical affliction was but one of her problems. She left school while quite young and was practically without education. This depressed her more than her infirmities and her sorrows increased. These were some of the trials that Jesus put little Rose through before she was found faithful to bear his stigmata. The more that Rose's suffering increased, the more her soul through the mystery of grace became more perfect. She no longer yearned for the things of this life, but she resigned herself completely to the divine workings of God with whom she was so deeply in love. She wanted to give herself wholeheartedly to Jesus' love and service by a close imitation of his perfect humility charity, obedience, mercy, compassion, and patience. It was only by her great love for Jesus and by the grace of God that she was able to endure the agony that followed and still go on living. Looking for no reward, she only desired to love him, serve him, and suffer with him. She no longer existed for her will was to imitate Christ in his obedience to his Father and in all his virtues. Thus, Marie Rose Ferrand's vocation of suffering began. It was a vocation that made difficult demands on her soul and called for long trials and sufferings. 
By God's gift of fortitude, her soul was strengthened against natural fear and supported her to the end in her vocation. Her will was strengthened to undertake without hesitation sufferings and trials to endure without complaint the slow martyrdom of lifelong tribulation. She began to hunger and thirst for suffering, for she believed that her love for Jesus grew in proportion to her suffering. To those who asked her about suffering, she gave the following spiritual recipe. Grind up all your sufferings in the mill of patience and silence. Mix them with the balsam of the passion of the Savior. Make them into a small pill, and the fire of charity will digest it. This is the city of Woonsocket in Rhode Island. Jesus, the divine gardener, now transplanted the little rose he had nurtured with his graces, and he began to shower her with even more gifts. In 1925, Rose moved from Fall River to Woonsocket, Rhode Island. She was now confined to her bed and could no longer move about with crutches. Her limbs became thin, weak, and deformed. She began to lay on a plank, or board covered with a quilt. Later, she was bound to her bed with sheets because her legs would roll up like a hoop. When this happened, it took more than one member of the family to get her back into proper position, and it caused so much pain that she fainted. The round table was within reach of Rose's right arm. In the little drawers that she kept were metals, precious blood cords, and prayer leaflets, which she gave to her many visitors. On the table are some relics which were given to her. Her deformed and twisted feet caused her much pain. Although her mother wrapped them in absorbent cotton, the bones sometimes pierced the skin. Her left arm became crippled with the fingernails of that undersized and deformed hand digging into her palm. Although she could use her right arm, she nevertheless had to wear a splint which extended from the elbow to the palm of that hand. The sufferings of Rose sometimes made her so weak that she could hardly breathe. She would lay almost lifeless, with her lips stuck to her teeth and an expression of agony on her face as though she were dying. Yet Rose never thought of her own sorrows, nor did she brood over them. She wished to suffer even more to console her Jesus. She wished only to love him and to help others to love him. One day, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to Rose in a vision and showed her a scroll. On this scroll, the 15 mysteries of the rosary appeared with the names of each of the Ferran children beside one of the mysteries. Rose was the child of the 10th mystery, Therefore, she knew that she was chosen to bear the stigmata of the crucifixion. She had great devotion to the passion of our Lord and a burning desire to make reparation to God for the sins of man. Little Rose's vocation was that of suffering, but her mission was one of reparation for souls. When sin is committed, the order of things as established by God is disturbed or damaged. This damage must be repaired as far as it is possible for us to do so, and this we do by reparation. To make reparation for the sins of our neighbors is to do something more precious than the giving of any material gift, because a soul is worth more than the entire material universe. Thus, great lovers of souls, such as Little Rose, give of themselves generously for this great work of reparation. The time had now arrived and the little victim of Jesus was about to be given her first mission. When Rose moved into the Diocese of Providence, it was a move into the center of a controversy that had been gaining momentum for some time. Out of a drive to raise funds for the construction of additional Catholic high schools, a difference of opinion arose between some of the faithful and their bishop. Those who opposed the bishop 
published a newspaper which expressed their views and aroused public opinion against the bishop and his drive. This opposition grew to such strength that the bishop took stern action against its leaders, and then rumors began to circulate concerning the possible formation of a schism. The bishop had heard of Little Rose. He knew that she was a victim soul, and in the hour of peril, he went to visit her. With tearful eyes, he said, My child, will you suffer for the Diocese of Providence, for its priests, and for those I was obliged to punish? Rose at once accepted and told her bishop that it would be her mission to pray for their return. She offered her prayers and sufferings and was often heard in ecstasy begging our Lord for the return of all of them at any cost. She would say, take my speech away if that will help. Take my eyes, take my mind. With tears she said, take everything I have and cherish. I am willing to suffer until the last one returns, even a hundred years, if you say so, wish it. It was about this time that she spent the time after her ecstatic Holy Communion, suffering the Passion in honor of the sacred wounds. It was also at this time that the stigmata were noticed. While Jesus' little victim silently suffered and prayed, a calm came over those who opposed the bishop, and after a short time, all those who had been punished submitted to the authority of the church. The prayers of Little Rose were answered. Her burning love for God and souls was so great that the loving hearts of Jesus and Mary showered this young victim soul with many gifts, such as ecstasies, visions, partial abstinence, bilocation, and the stamping of his sacred wounds on her body as a final step of his approval. Rose often went into ecstasy, and she did so whenever she was called by God. Sometimes she remained in this state for minutes, and at other times for more than an hour. While in this state, she would ask our Lord to bless her religious articles, she would take a crucifix, rosary, or medal in her hand. Then she would tell Jesus the name of the person for whom it was intended, and she asked him to bless them and to grant special favors for those who would use them. Afterward, she always asked the first priest who visited her to put the church's blessing on them before she gave them to anyone. At times, while in ecstasy, she would sing a song to Jesus one to the Blessed Mother and another to St. Joseph. Once while singing, she paused a few times and was heard saying, How sweet it is to rest by the side, O my Jesus, thou knowest that I love thee. Those who saw her in this ecstatic state all remarked at how beautiful she looked at the time. Everything was always modest and edifying. Rose was a model of purity, of patience, of humility, and her words were full of love, love for God. When she came out of this state, her soul was strengthened with a fortitude that overcame the obstacles in the way of her salvation, and her soul acquired a thirst for sacrifice that even martyrdom could not satisfy. Many times, while in ecstasy, she was heard begging our Lord to spare others and pile upon her their miseries and pains. Sometimes Rose was permitted to take on the pains of childbirth for her sisters or friends. At one time, one of her sisters was in a hospital 40 miles away. She was in pain and called to Rose for help. Immediately, the sister saw Rose in the hospital room and all her pain vanished. Meanwhile, in her room in Woonsocket, Rose was observed going through the pains of childbirth. Rose did this three times in one year. On the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1928, Rose took her vows and made her profession as foundress of the Sisters of Reparation of the Sacred Wounds of Jesus. Speaking to Father Leonard, who was a friend of the family, she said, you know, 
my community was approved by my bishop. Jesus will need that community before long. But will you live long enough to see it, Rose? She was asked. Jesus said nothing about that. I am ready to live or die as he wills, as nothing is impossible to him. He can give life to my community without my help, for I am nothing in his hands. He alone can make all things out of nothing. How did little Rose occupy herself when she wasn't suffering acutely or praying? Every day from midnight to 1 a.m., she made her holy hour of reparation. From 1 a.m. to 4 a.m., she kept herself busy doing whatever she could. She could only use her right hand, but with this hand, she was able to do some amazing things. She made bookmarks with pictures and ribbons. She braided palms and mended beads, did some needlework, and made beautiful paper crosses and stars. When asked how she was able to make these things, she replied, my little Jesus comes and helps me. Father Adrian Gauthier, smiling gently at little Rose. Father Gauthier from St. Rock's Church in Fall River drove to Woonsocket every Sunday afternoon to visit Rose to see how she was coming along. Father Gauthier was her first spiritual director. At 4 a.m., she dozed until 6 a.m. Rose said she did not sleep. During her dozing hours, she heard all that was going on. With the exception of Fridays, the day on which she suffered the passion of our Lord, the door of the Ferron home was open to visitors. People went home fully rewarded or empty-handed, depending on their own dispositions. Some were ordinary visitors, but most of them were afflicted with sicknesses or family troubles. They came looking for help. Among them were priests, nuns, and people from every station of life. Rich, poor, young or old, they all felt at ease with Rose. They felt good being with her. Some people remarked that going up to Rose's room was like going up to heaven because they felt the presence of Jesus there. One time, a businessman from the Midwest came to visit Rose. On seeing her lying in bed, he was moved to tears and said, Oh, you poor little girl, you are so sick. Never having seen or heard of the man before, Rose looked up at him and said, Don't cry for me. You're sicker than I am. You've been away from Jesus for 35 years. When the man heard these words, he cried all the more. But after this visit, he became a daily communicant, made the Stations of the Cross daily, and died in poverty, loving Jesus. Another time, a nun telephoned Rose's house. She wanted to know whether she could visit Rose. Mrs. Ferrin answered the phone while Rose was in ecstasy. She began talking with the sister when, all of a sudden, Rose revived and said, Tell Sister Loretta to come over. Rose knew who was calling. At another time, a few priests were driving through Woonsocket, and they decided to stop and visit little Rose. They had heard of Rose and wished to meet her. A lady answered the door and greeted the priests. Then they heard Rose ring her bell, and she called out, Tell Father Vitkus to come up. In Rose's life, there were very many incidents similar to the ones just mentioned. In 1926, the stigmata were noticed. This supernatural gift permitted her to participate in the passion of Christ in an outward manner, to suffer a share of the passion of Christ which exceeds all earthly sufferings. Because the stigmata made difficult demands on her soul, Rose had to undergo long trials and sufferings. Only after a long period of purgation did these wounds make their appearance, the first to appear were the marks of the flagellation on her arms. During Lent of 1927, when Rose was 24 years old, the marks of the hands and feet appeared. In January of 1928, the stigmata of the thorns appeared. And during Lent of 1929, the stigmata of the heart. In August of the same year, her eyes shed tears of blood. And from that time on, she represented the holy face of Jesus each Friday.
Some of Rose's stigmata, such as the five wounds and the crown of thorns, were more permanent. But when she suffered the passion on Fridays, other wounds appeared and were gone the following day. Two such wounds were on the shoulder and on the lower part of the neck. The larger of the two was the shoulder wound, which was a large red blotch that was very painful. All of her wounds were painful, and some were deep in the flesh. On Thursdays about midnight, the wounds began to bleed slowly, and blood would ooze from her eyes. Thus the drama of the passion began. From the hours of 12 to 3 in the afternoon on Fridays, she represented the crucifixion. She went into ecstasy, and her right arm straightened out as though she were on a cross. Her left arm was tied and could not move. Her chest came forward and shoulders went backward as if pulled by the arms. When this took place, the arm was wrenched from the socket and remained outstretched until after the ecstasy. Then a doctor was called and the arm was rotated back into place. This sometimes took a half hour to perform and was accompanied with excruciating pain. The doctor couldn't understand how she could suffer so much. On Saturdays, the wounds stopped bleeding, her appearance became normal, and the remaining blood dried up and scaled off. With the aid of lukewarm water, her mother would dampen and peel the blood off. During the Lenten season, as Holy Week and Good Friday approached, her sufferings were greater. The agony she endured seemed to be beyond human endurance. Yet through all of this, she never complained. In August of 1931, when Jesus removed the visible stigmata, the blood continued to rush to those parts of the body where the wounds had been and caused an intense agony of pain. There was no more bleeding, and all of the stigmata disappeared, except those of the head which always remained and were visible at her death. Little Rose was a mystic, and to be a mystic, one must be a great lover of God and man. Our Lord appeared to Little Rose in her early childhood, preparing her for ecstatic union with Christ. Finally, after the dark night of her spirit, she achieved the highest mystical union, and the extraordinary gifts which accompanied this degree of union accredited her as Christ's chosen victim. It was while Rose was suffering the painful purification of this dark night that she endured many humiliations. Rose prayed for the removal of the visible stigmata. She had several reasons for doing so, and one of them was the danger of pride. She was afraid of pride, for she knew that it could harm her spiritual life. With her confessor's approval, she prayed for that favor and obtained it. So the wounds which drew the admiration that frightened her were replaced with a number of crushing humiliations which were extremely trying to her and to her parents. Rose had an irresistible eagerness for the Blessed Sacrament. Once, the priest who was attending her was away for two weeks. During that time, she did not receive our Lord. All she could do was wait and resign herself to God's will. Rose said nothing about what she felt at the time, but later, when asked about it, the tears streamed from her cheeks because it really was a martyrdom for her to be deprived of the Blessed Sacrament. When God removed the visible stigmata from Rose, then rumors began to circulate and grow that Rose and her family were perpetuating a hoax. With her heart broken by what was going on around her, and with her soul torn by the night of the soul, she staggered and fell many times under the weight of the cross but her confidence in God gave her hope, for while she endured these sufferings, she constantly had in mind the goodness and mercy of God, and this thought kept her from despair. Rose accepted willingly, as from God's loving hands, all the mental anguish meted out to her, the bitter humiliations, misunderstandings, condemnation, and abandonment by many, even her nearest and dearest, like the Lord, she was for a time forsaken, regarded as a fraud, and even treated as one mentally unbalanced. Through all of this, she endured. She never once complained, 
never said an unkind word to her calumniators, never lost her serenity and cheerfulness and peace. Concerning those who spoke ill of her, Rose felt compassion for them. Her resignation to her own misery made her exceedingly tender and compassionate to the feelings of others. To a sister, she once said, Jesus was dragged through the streets and the mud, and I wouldn't want to be treated better than my master. When somebody once remarked to little Rose that it was a wonder her Jesus allowed her to suffer so much, seeing she loved him so deeply, her answer full of heavenly wisdom was, the caresses of heaven are not like those of earth. To face death calmly and suffer patiently as Rose did are two virtues worthy of imitation. She prayed that her suffering would not be noticeable. She didn't mind how much she suffered, but she wanted to spare her parents. While in ecstasy, she appealed to Jesus and said, Oh my Jesus, I wish to suffer more and more, but spare my parents. Increase my sufferings, if you will, but allow no one to see them. Put a smile on my lips and a ray of thy glory in my eyes, and show them that I am happy. From the 15th of April, 1936, her condition grew steadily worse. She sometimes fainted when she tried to speak. Her stomach hurt so much that even water became unbearable, and her head pained so that the slightest noise caused her to faint. In the last week of her life, her suffering was so intense and the loss of blood from a recent hemorrhage so great that all she could say over and over again was, my Jesus, my Jesus. On May 2nd, she received the last sacraments and at 10 a.m. on Monday, May 11th, 1936, shortly after the prayers for the dying had been said, the soul of Marie Rose Ferrin left her bed of martyrdom to be judged by her Jesus whom she loved so intensely. Her hunger and thirst for the cross consumed her, for that was her wish. Her act of immolation found on her person read in part, I offer myself as a victim, a holocaust, that I may live in constant charity, begging thee, O my Jesus, to consume me without ceasing, that I may be a martyr of thy love. When Father Boyer, Little Rose's confessor and biographer, was notified of her death, he came as quickly as he could. He arrived with two suitcases. He cradled Little Rose in his arms and cried so hard that his tears fell on Rose's face. In the suitcases, he brought materials to touch to Little Rose. She was placed in the private chapel of the Ferrin home with the altar in the background. On Tuesday noon, the doors were opened, the sisters with the children entered, and people continued visiting until the funeral on Friday. The crowds of people were amazing. Nearly 15,000 who viewed her remains signed the register. A special police detail was required, and traffic was rerouted because of the crowds. Most of these people were those who had known her or had visited her during her lifetime. On Friday morning, Holy Family Church was filled long before the cortege left the Ferrin home, and many waited outside the church on the steps and sidewalk. More than 4,000 people attended the funeral mass. The various local newspapers carried articles on her death and funeral. This is what the French newspaper of Woonsocket wrote. This morning, we have seen one of the most magnificent tokens of esteem and veneration that can be imagined. We have seen such demonstrations for the great and powerful of this world. It was an eloquent tribute to the memory of a little girl who became famous by suffering silently and joyfully for God's holy love. Marie Rose Ferrin Stigmatic. Born May 24th, 1902. Died May 11th, 1936, at the age of 33. All of little Rose's life, all her sufferings and her death, 
were for the same reason, for love of Jesus and for love of souls. While Little Rose lived, people came to her with problems and illnesses, and many were helped through her prayers. Since her death, thousands of people have reported favors by privately praying and asking for her intercession. The following reports will give you an idea of how people have been helped. I'm recording from <clears throat> Our Sacred Art Residence in Shenzhou, Taiwan. <clears throat> Regarding Little Rose's crucifix. When I was in Arisville, New York in 1947-48, I prepared to go to Woonsocket to visit Little Rose's home and chapel. I found out when I did go there that the mother knew that I was coming. That was in June of 1948. The mother of Little Rose knew many things that she had no way of knowing unless Little Rose had told her. The Rose had been dead 12 years when I arrived at their home at 271 Providence Street in Woonsocket. I knew that Little Rose was appearing to her mother, so I tried in many ways to get the mother to admit it and to tell me what Little Rose had said. But she would only smile and say, Little Rose taught me that silence is golden. So I, after three days, <clears throat> I said goodbye forever to the mother and family of Little Rose because I was going to Baltimore to say goodbye to forever to my own mother and my brothers and sisters. In those days, the Jesuit missionaries of China never went home because originally when they first went to China, one out of three boats were lost on the sea. So once you got to the mission, you wanted to stay there to save your life. So I said goodbye forever to Mrs. Farron and her family. Uh, her two daughters, Flora and Irene, took me to the railroad station in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. When they returned, uh, the mother told them that uh, Little Rose had given her the instruction to give to me the crucifix that Little Rose held in her hand when she died. All the members of the family wanted to have this crucifix, but Little Rose's mother kept it for herself, a very precious thing. 
And then Irene and Flora said to uh, Mrs. Uh, mother, Mrs. Friend, why didn't you give it to him? She said, well, I couldn't find it. But after two days, little Rose said to me, don't worry, mother, he is coming back again before he goes to China. On the train to New York, about three hours, I received the constant fragrance of uh, rose powder perfume, more spiritual than material. At the same time, when the, uh, the uh, wheels of the train were turning, the thought came to my mind at every turn, you must go back, you must go back. So I did go back on July the 19th. That's 1948. After I said goodbye forever to mother, my mother and family. So when I came back, I was very surprised. I didn't know about little Rose appearing to the mother and telling her to give me the crucifix. I was very surprised because she herself came up to me and said, little Rose told me to give you this, her crucifix, that she held in her hand before she died. And then she placed it in my hands very lovingly this crucifix with her hand, one hand above mine, the other hand below mine, holding that precious crucifix. She said, Little Rose told me this would do more good in China than here. I smelled this fragrance, a very strange body fragrance on the crucifix, and asked the mother and Flora if they smelled. They said, No. They had never smelt any fragrance on the crucifix, but now they could smell it. And for Mrs. Farron, this uh, smelled like the stigma of the wound in Little Rose's right hand in which she held this crucifix. I said uh, goodbye forever again to Little Rose's mother and family and went by plane to uh, California to take the boat to China. And now Little Rose's crucifix and the other relics left a, a trail of fragrance across the United States and on the boat to China and also in China. In California, many people smell fragrances from this crucifix, many different kinds. A group of 30 people, almost all of them would have a fragrance from the crucifix. Some would have it when I had uh, held it up to them and and waves of fragrance, rose fragrance, or different fragrances which come from this crucifix. But when they held it in their hand, they couldn't smell anything. Some could not smell it at a distance, but only could smell it when it was near to them. It had different kinds of fragrances, different kinds of flower fragrance, incense, and all sorts of fragrance that for many of them, they never smelled before. It was very exotic, very strange. So this happened with so many different groups of people who received the fragrances from this crucifix. A priest and even a cardinal and uh, religious of different denominations, different orders, seminarians, lay people, men and women and children. In Marilla I went to the hospital and there this Miss Seesaw was suffering there from asthma and I gave her the crucifix to hold and she had a very strange, she says, I know this crucifix has been held for a very long time. Another young person, a young girl, held the crucifix and became very scared. She said, there's something very scary about this crucifix. Another held it and said, this person who held this suffered very much. They, they could feel the suffering coming from this crucifix. So various kinds of experiences concerning this crucifix were held by many different people. Some were cured by it, and not by the crucifix itself, of course, but by Jesus, whom this crucifix represented, and through the intercession of little Rose, who suffered very much. I was in uh, Shanghai for a while.
while, then it went to Bei and then King, and then to Bei Ping. On the 13th of October, 1948, I flew up to Bei Ping, Peking, because the line was cut, the rail was cut by the communist soldiers, and that's the only way to get to Bei Ping, to Peking. Up there, I had the various experiences with this crucifix, giving off fragrances and curing people. When the communists approached uh, Beiping, Peking, I was sent back to Shanghai. And there I tried to study Mandarin in a city that spoke Shanghaiese. So very many people came to be blessed with the crucifix because the rumors spread that the cures that it caused a great uh, caused great peace of mind that took place when people prayed to Little Rose. There was one priest who was going blind, who was very much worried about his blindness. He couldn't say Mass, any special Mass, only the Mass of the Blessed Mother or the Mass of the Dead that he had memorized. So he came to me asking for prayers to Little Rose that his blindness would be cured. He was very, very worried, very upset. So I had him make a novena, a little rose. At the end of the novena, he received a tremendous burst of joy from inside of him. Tremendous burst of joy. And the people remarked that in his sermons, that's all he could do was give sermons, that he was a changed man, that he had joy instead of sadness in his voice as he gave the sermons in the big church of Zigawe, the cathedral of Shanghai. Because so many Shanghai people came to see me and talk to my little rose, I had no time to study a Mandarin. I was afraid my superior would send me away from the city if this continued, so I gave the crucifix into the hands of his father, Jiang. And many people went to him, and he talked about uh, little rose, and the people came up and kissed the crucifix, or touch their rosaries or religious articles to it. But uh, still people came to me, so I was sent off to uh, Nanking. But when the communists came to Nanking, approached the city, I was sent back to Shanghai. Well, many people who didn't know, understand what Father Zhang was talking about, about this crucifix, they touched their rosaries also to the crucifix, and afterwards their rosaries gave, gave off fragrances. Now the Franciscan missionary Mary's sister in charge of our kindergarten, our parish kindergarten, she told me of her own, her own experience when she was a little girl in the uh, uh, orphanage in Zigawe near the cathedral that she heard Father Zhang speaking, but she didn't know what he was saying. But she also, and her uh, companions, who didn't understand what he was saying, touched the rosaries through this crucifix. And when they went home, their rosaries gave off fragrances for many days, different kinds of fragrances. So we have uh, very many kinds of experiences that uh, puzzled me very much. I could never understand to whom these fragrances were to be given, why, or when, or how, and different kinds. And uh, uh, Father, one of the Jesuit priests in uh, Shanghai there at Sigawe, he had a very poor, bad cold and he couldn't smell, but through this bad cold he could smell the the fragrance from the crucifix. Another Jesuit there who had, uh, was in Prague working with the wounded from the air raids in Prague, and they had the wounded in the church there, a big church there. He said the fragrance coming from this crucifix, a little rose, reminded him of the wounds he smelled of these people lying there in the church who were badly wounded from the air raids. So very many other people told me the same thing about their experiences about this crucifix. How it reminded them of one thing or the other, but sometimes people would hold the crucifix and get very scared. Other times they would receive a great peace, a peace that came from the inside of them, that did not leave them. 
So little Rose was called in China the one who gives interior peace. She was called the five wounds little Rose who gives interior peace, the peace of heart. Uh, so this crucifix was uh, given into the hands of Elizabeth Hall, a catechist who took out communion for me each morning to the sick because I was afraid to go to the sick people because the communists would follow me, a foreigner. It would be bad, bad for these uh, sick people to let the communists know that they were Catholics. So she took out communion each day from the sacristy to these people. So uh, when I was arrested, she had this crucifix, this precious crucifix. I was expelled from China and she went to prison and I took for granted that the communists had destroyed this crucifix, which they did to all religious articles when they arrested anyone. Six years later, I learned that uh, she was uh, got out of Shanghai by making a Vina Little Rose. And she was on the last plane from Hong Kong to the United States as a refugee who could get asylum in the U.S become a citizen there. I knew then that she had gone to uh, the United States. I didn't know where. So when my superior sent me to the United States to uh, get money for our seminarians, uh, Father Hu had me in his car in uh, Los Angeles. He stopped for a little while on the street to go into a store. And then a priest came walking down and he said to me, hi, Father, where are you from? And I said, I'm from China. He said, yesterday I met a girl from China. I said, what's her name? He said, Elizabeth Hall. I said, where does she live? He said, I don't know. But if you go to Chinatown, the sister there at the parish can tell you. So I did get the, the information about her address from the sister. I went to visit Elizabeth. And when she opened the door, I said, hello, Elizabeth, where is it? And she knew at once what I meant by it, the crucifix. She said, wait a minute. And she came back, holding the crucifix in her hand. She said, here it is. After six years, I thought it was gone forever, and it was returned to me. So this precious crucifix I wear around my neck, a chain of my neck, and have it in the pocket near my heart all the time. At nighttime, I keep it on in my hand, one hand or the other, or on my chest if I'm lying on, the, on my back. It's a very precious uh, crucifix. And I'm waiting for the time, the time when the decree against Little Rose will be annulled and uh, declared null and void from the beginning. And then I'm sure that, that God will begin again through the intercession of the Rose to make many manifestations through this crucifix. I've kept a little key in Taiwan about it. I'm waiting for God to begin to reveal his his little rose. Really and truly this uh, Sacred Heart Church of ours is Little Rose of Sacred Heart Church. In the cornerstone is a stainless steel receptacle in which I put the history of this Little Rose of Sacred Heart Church in both Chinese and English. And the Franciscan missionary sister who works in our worked in our kindergarten, she wrote the story in Chinese of how she met this crucifix without knowing whose it was and how the fragrances persisted on her rosary. So the story is in uh, this stainless steel tube in the what the bishop called the first stone, what we call the cornerstone of the church. And Posterity will be able to, to read it. So that is, in short, in a few minutes, the story of this precious Little Rose's crucifix that I have in my possession, and I thank God for entrusting it to me. Amen. Mario J. Machado of Los Angeles, California, gives the following report. In 1950, in Shanghai, China, I was stricken with diphtheria and hospitalized at Holy Cross Hospital. Not realizing that I had been inoculated for diphtheria, I was given a full dose of the toxin at the time. 
I began to convulse, went into shock, and was in the process of dying. Father Palm of Christ the King Church was called to give me the last rites. Under my pillow, he left a crucifix rosary from Marie Rose Ferrin. I was pronounced dead, but miraculously recovered. I am forever grateful and indebted. If it were not for little Rose, I would not be here in the USA. Father Luke Zimmer of Fillmore, California, calls his testimony a blessing in disguise. In April 1944, I was given a blessing in disguise by Almighty God. However, I did not realize this at the time. I became ill with rheumatic fever, which would cause me to spend many months in bed. This illness is painful and can come back again and again. I had it four times within the next two and a half years. Therefore, most of that time was spent in bed. During 1945, a friend gave me a book on the life of Little Rose Ferrin, which was written by Father Boyer. The name of the book was She Wears a Crown of Thorns. I read this book at first with curiosity because I had never read or heard of anyone who bore the wounds of Christ in his or her body. Really, I did not know much about my religion because I never had the opportunity to go to Catholic schools. Thus, many of the things I read in that book seemed strange to me. After reading this book, I began to read it again. It became like a magnet, always drawing me back to it. I began to know and love little Rose Ferrin. Her life was one of love, purity, suffering, sacrifice, self-giving, humility, courage, strength, and fortitude. The love she had for Almighty God was evident. The respect and obedience she manifested towards those who were her spiritual directors and spiritual leaders were beyond question. It was easy to see that here was a young woman who desired to do the will of God before all else. Her love for souls caused her to pray for them, to make reparation, and to do anything to win their reconciliation with God. The virtuous life she lived was outstanding, and this is what should be stressed. All the things that happened during her life were accidental and not essential to her sanctity. The same is true for us in our life. God gives these extraordinary gifts to whom he wills, and it is for the benefit of others. We know that many souls were drawn to God because of these extraordinary gifts given to her by God but she paid the price by carrying the cross as all true disciples of Christ must do. Little Rose taught me how to carry my cross with joy and a willingness to do God's will. I was able to see the importance of suffering and that it, it had a meaning because I could unite my pains, disappointments, aloneness, and prayers with those of Christ. I could unite myself with Christ at each mass which was being said throughout the world, offering this for my sins and for those of others. Life now has a meaning, and I was able to be patient and wait for God to grant me health in his own good time. I was not cured through the intercession of Little Rose, but I did receive many spiritual blessings for which I will be eternally grateful. The blessings and graces I received from knowing Little Rose were much greater than a physical cure. I promised Little Rose that I would visit her grave and home. I did not have an opportun opportunity to do this until late summer of 1950. Since then, I had the occasion to visit with Flora, Little Rose's sister, many times. I had the privilege to speak with her mother and, shortly before she died, she told me that she would pray for me. If I remember correctly, Flora told me that these were the last words she spoke. I went to her funeral, which I shall always remember. I will now share an experience in my life since it has to do with Little Rose. On June 14, 1955, I was driving through Rhode Island, and it seemed to me that God said, Father Luke, I want you to say the 15-decade rosary every day until you die. I did not want to because I thought I was too busy. I even explained to God the whole schedule of my daily life, but he said the same thing again. 
Then I said, okay, I will say the 15 decade rosary if you give me a 15 decade rosary. The next day I was going to visit Flora. I had written a postcard that I was coming, but when I arrived at 1 p.m., no one answered the door. I prayed the rosary and other prayers. I came back at 2 p.m. with the same result. Again, I said another rosary and meditated. I went back at 3 p.m. with the same thing happening. Again, I prayed as before. Finally, at 4 p.m., I tried once more with the idea of going home if no one answered. There was no answer, so I decided to go home. As I was walking down the stairs toward the car, a lady drove up. She told me that they must be home since the car was there. She told me that she had a pass key, so she went in to see what had happened. She found them sleeping, and that was the reason why they did not hear me at the door. Then Flora and the woman who came sat at the dining table. We were talking, and I asked Flora if she had anything she could give me that belonged to little Rose. The woman who came said, Father, I have something. I asked her what it was, but she would not tell me. She told me she had to go home to get it. She left and was gone for half an hour. When she came back, she said, I don't know why I have to give this to you, but I feel that I have to. She gave me a 15-decade rosary. She told me that little Rose gave the rosary to her and that our Lord had blessed it. If I remember correctly, she said that little Rose had made the rosary. She wanted me to have it. All I could say was, I am trapped. The rosary had a very strong smell. I showed it to my spiritual director and he told me to put it in a glass of water to see if the smell would go away. The next morning, the smell was stronger than ever. I have said the rosary every day since June 15, 1955. And on many occasions, the rosary still has that strong rose smell. I do not give the rose smell any importance but it does help me to pray the rosary with more devotion and attention. Little Rose has come into my life and my life has been much richer for it. I have much to be thankful for and I do owe much to Little Rose. Father Zimmer gave this testimony on May 1st, 1990. Mr. and Mrs. Pendola of Wanta, New York relate how little Rose came to their daughter, Mary. Before my daughter, Mary Pendola, went home to God, she had three visions of little Rose. Mary died on April 26, 1966. She was born on Palm Sunday, March 21, 1948. She died of cancer of the kidney. Mary met little Rose through a very dear friend, Mr. Joseph Lamangino from Lindenhurst, Long Island. Mr. Lamangino has great devotion to Little Rose. He gave Mary, my daughter, an 8x10 colored picture of Little Rose back in 1965 and the book, She Wears a Crown of Thorns. Mary read this book and fell in love with Little Rose. At the time, Mary didn't know she had cancer. She prayed to little Rose, and right after Mary started to get sick, she had just graduated from St. Michael's High School in Brooklyn. She was just 17 years old. She graduated in June of 1965 and was operated on in September of 1965. Mary was never well after that. The doctor told me she had eight months to live. We prayed to little Rose for a miracle. About two months before Mary left this world, she had her first vision of Rose. With great love for little Rose, Mary said to me, Mom, get my rosary. Little Rose is here, and she's going to say a rosary with me. And Mary, with all her suffering, held the rosary in her hands that really she could not have done. She said the rosary with her. Sometimes no words came out, but her mouth was moving, saying it. The second vision is when little Rose came and told Mary that she wanted a basket of flowers left at the church with 200 leaflet prayers 
that I had ordered from Mrs. Normandin at Chester, New Jersey. She wanted the flowers and leaflets to be together, so I had it done right away. I called my sister-in-law and she brought them to Our Lady of Loretto Church. The third vision was that Mary said, Little Rose was here, and I can't tell you what she said. I believe Rose told her she would meet her in heaven, and she wasn't or I wasn't going to get the miracle I was praying to Rose for. Mary, one day right before she closed her eyes to this world, felt the crown of thorns on her head. Mary kept Rose's big picture on the dresser. She always had to have Rose near her. Mary also had her hip bones like Rose's and her feet like the picture in the book. One hour before Mary died, she had a vision of our Lord, and she told me, Mom, please leave the room, because God is here. And she talked to our Lord in his language of love. And one hour after, she waved goodbye and said when she gets to heaven, she'll pray for me. Little Rose did give me a miracle, being with Mary in heaven. Now I am spreading the message of Little Rose, and I'll keep doing until I die. I know it will make Mary very happy. Mrs. Leah Vitale of Valley Stream, New York, describes how she was saved from the sinking ship, the Andrea Doria. My name is Mrs. Leah Vitale. About July 14th or 15th of 1956, I was in Italy and preparing to leave for home after spending three months with my father's relatives, including my 98-year-old grandfather. My relatives and I had been doing quite a bit of crying because the time was drawing near for my departure for Naples, where I would be boarding the ship, the Anvia Doria, for home. On one of those nights I had a dream, and in the dream I was crying bitterly when St. Anthony came over to me and put his arm around me and told me not to cry, but to pray and to pray especially for little Rose and that everything would be all right. When I awoke the next morning, I told my relatives about my dream and also that I was concerned about my sister Rose, who was sometimes referred to as Little Rose, because my mother's name was also Rose. It was a small town I was in and it would have taken much to do to get a telephone call through to the States before the morning of the 16th, which the day I was to leave for Naples. On July 18th, I sailed from Naples on the Andrea Doria cabin class. I mentioned cabin class because originally I had planned to travel tourist class, but changed my ticket for cabin class which may have put me in a different part of the ship. About 11.10 p.m. on July 25th, I was awakened by a loud noise and found myself out of my bunk. The three women that also shared the cabin and I realized something was wrong when we heard a lot of commotion outside our door. We quickly put on our life jackets and left our cabin. Our ship had collided with the ice cutter Stockholm. That night was a very foggy one and the ship's fog horns had been sounding for quite some time. The next three hours were frightening and confusing because the electricity was out and the loudspeaker systems were not working. What we did know was that the ship was listening and badly. We could do nothing but wait and pray that help would come. I don't know why, but some or all of the lifeboats could not be disconnected from their holdings. Two ships came to our rescue besides the Stockholm. One of them was the Ile de France, which had left that day for France and was had turned around and came to help when they received our SOS. The fog had miraculously lifted and from a distance we could see her all lit up like a Christmas tree and with her horns blasting as if to say, hang in there, we're coming to help you, a sight I will never forget. About 2.20 a.m. of the 26th St. Anne's Feast Day, I slid down the rope from two decks above and into a lifeboat from the Ile de France. I got off the ship barefooted and in pajamas. 
Some time later, an announcement was made to the passengers of the Ile de France for donations of clothing and shoes for adults and children. A young lady came to me and offered me a pair of shoes, some underclothes, and a dress. I have kept that dress all these years as a reminder of that lady's kindness. It was not only her, however. People were coming back and forth, holding up clothes and asking if anyone could use any of it. It was the most beautiful display of Christian charity I had ever seen. Those people were whom I would call the beautiful people. I lost everything I had except for my wristwatch, which for some unknown reason I left on that night when I retired. But it was very sad that I had lost my rosary that my young nephew had given me some time back. <clears throat> the day after I returned home, a reporter and photographer came to my home to interview me about the accident and they asked me what I had lost. I told them I had lost everything, including the rosary which I had treasured. The story appeared in our local newspaper, the Long Island Press, the following day. The Saturday of that week, my mother answered the doorbell to a very kind woman who told her she had read about me in the newspaper and came to give me a pair of rosary beads. My mother invited her to come in and we talked for a time. She then took out of her purse a pamphlet and a relic of little rose and asked us to pray to her and for her so she may one day be recognized by our church. You see, I had heard of Little Rose from St. Anthony that night in my dream, and I believe this kind lady came to verify it. I have prayed to her and have been helped by her many, many times. The first time when she got me off that sinking ship, and I did not even know her name then. Thank you for all I have learned about Little Rose from you since the time she was made known to me by St. Anthony and that kind lady that came to my home. I will continue praying that one day our church will recognize Little Rose. Thank you for allowing me to give my testimony. Respectfully, Leah Vitale. I reside in Valley Stream, New York. Mrs. Mary Mignano of Cortland, New York, states that doctors were baffled at the recovery of her sister. I want to relate a miracle through the intercession of Little Rose. On August 22, 1969, my sister entered the Shadyside Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for tests. I was told later that when she entered the hospital, she was very weak and her blood pressure was up to 340. The tests showed she apparently had been living with one kidney for a good many years. How many the doctor did not know. Therefore, the one remaining kidney had been carrying the load to the point where it was not functioning properly. This, in turn, caused her eyes to go bad. She was also hemorrhaging behind the eyes, had an enlarged heart, her body temperature was 106 degrees. The doctors said she had only a matter of time to live. Could be one hour, one day, or one month. I went to visit my sister in the hospital on Sunday, August 31st, as I did not find out until August 30th that she was as sick as I mentioned before. I took one look at her and knew she was very bad. She did not recognize me talked insanely. She was seeing things which were not in the room, and she was extremely weak. It took two of us to put her in a chair, and she could not sit for any length of time when we had to put her back to bed. Immediately, I took one of the little Novena to Mary Rose Farron pamphlets and tucked it under my sister's pillow with the prayer to little Rose to help my sister get well, at least until she could straighten out her affairs. My sister did not have a will. Also, she received Holy Communion for the first time in 30 years. I had to leave Pittsburgh on Labor Day to come back to Ithaca. I kept in touch, and all I would say was she was very critical. On September 13th, I again visited my sister in the hospital and stayed a few days. She was still very weak, would not eat, and could not walk. The story was the same. It was only a matter of time. I had a consultation with the doctor, and he suggested we put her in a nursing home, as there was nothing more they could do for her. I told the doctor that I believed in miracles. 
and was hoping that my sister would get well enough to go home. He said she was too far gone. There was too much wrong with her. He mentioned they were able to get her blood pressure down to 160. He said he could not understand how she was living as long as she had. After that, I took out a little pin with little Rose's picture, which I carried in my wallet, and I pinned it on my sister's hospital jacket and asked little Rose to make my sister well enough to go home. I took the pamphlet and asked my sister to kiss little Rose's picture and pray to her. I then proceeded to tell my sister that the doctor suggested we put her in a nursing home. She said she wanted to go to her own home. I then told her she had to make up her mind to eat and learn to walk, and perhaps the doctor may consider that she go to her own home. Of course, I said this just to keep up her spirits, never dreaming it would come true. She said she would start to eat and learn to walk. Again, I had to leave my sister on September 16th. We never did mention to my sister just how bad she was, but I think that when she was thinking sanely, she knew what the score was. On September 25th, I phoned the hospital as I was not informed as to whether she was sent to a nursing home. And lo and behold, she was still there. But to my utter amazement, her voice was as clear as a bell and she talked so wonderful. I asked her if she was eating and she said, yes, yes. I asked her if she was walking and she said, yes. I told her I did not believe she was walking. Then she had me speak to the lady who had the bed next to hers, whom I had met previously. And she told me my sister was walking unassisted all over the place. My sister even said she had taken a shower all by herself. This is a miracle through the intercession of little Rose. One of my sister's friends told me that the doctor had told her that no one had gone out of the hospital alive with what my sister had wrong with her. She even baffled the doctors. Tuesday of this week, September 30th, my sister left the hospital to go to her own home. She is walking, eating, and talking sensibly. I know that she will have time to straighten out her personal affairs. I still say that little Rose is a saint and she should be canonized. My name is Fran Sadowski from Sterling Heights, Michigan. And I'm relating a testimony for my deceased sister-in-law, Wanda. The photo shows Wanda sitting in Mr. Farron's chair. And little Rose's sister Florima is standing beside her and holding a flower made by her sister, Little Rose. On January the 12th, 1960, my mother-in-law, Mrs. Stephanie Sadowski, for the second day, was suffering from terrible stomach pains that caused her to have a very severe coughing spell that left her gasping for air. Since the other members of the family were not home, I didn't know what to do. But every time I walked into the bedroom, I received a most beautiful fragrance that seemed to come from one corner of the room. And I'd walk out, it would be gone. And as soon as I would return to that corner, I would get it very strong. I looked around and standing on the floor was a bottle of holy water that little Rose was washed with after her death. The closer I got to the bottle, the stronger the fragrance became. It led me into the bedroom of my mother-in-law. I handed her the bottle and told her to bless herself. She made the sign of the cross on her head, lips, heart, and stomach. And we asked little Rose to help her. Immediately the coughing stopped and the pain left her. Within a half hour, the family returned home, bringing with them a circular on little Rose. I sat down and opened it and the very first case that I read was exactly like my mother-in-law's. Tears of gratitude filled our eyes. This is strange, but I seem to feel little Rose smiling. Praise to God for giving us someone like little Rose who so loves souls. And our prayer is that she will soon be on our altars for the world to know of her powerful intercessions. Mrs. 
Stephanie Sadowski cannot write, so she will put her kiss on this testimony and a prayer for Little Rose. In the mid-1960s, several of us decided to drive to Winsocket, Rhode Island to visit Little Rose's grave. When we were near Precious Blood Cemetery, my sister-in-law, Wanda, suggested that we stop at a florist and get some flowers for Rose's grave. And she said, I wonder what kind of flowers Rose would like. Let's turn the radio on and see if she will tell us. And Wanda turned the radio on and the song that was playing was, 18 Yellow Roses Came Today. And Wanda said, I guess she wants yellow roses. We asked our friend Jean to go into the shop to buy the roses. And we entered the shop, the manager said, hello, what can I do for you? And Jean answered, I'd like to buy some roses. And the man replied, oh, I'm so sorry, but I've sold all the red roses and all I have left are 18 yellow roses. And with big smiles on her face, we took the 18 yellow roses and placed them on the head of Rose's grave. The photo you see was taken at the time. <laughs> 